Thank you, Jonathan, that reading of Scripture. I hope you will keep your Bibles there, Mark, to that 20th chapter of Numbers. I want to start this morning by sharing with you a story. This was back in 2007. How many of you are familiar with what's called a claw machine? How many of you have gotten fooled by a claw machine in your life? How many of you wasted money on a claw machine in your life? Yeah. I'll never forget, I was preaching up in North Houston at the time, and I got a call from one of my shepherds that his grandson and his family had went out to eat one evening. And during that evening, his grandson asked him for some money to play the claw machine that was located in the front of the restaurant. So, being a good papa, he thought, okay, I'm going to give him that, uh, I don't know if it's 50 cents or a dollar, I don't know how much money it was, but he gives his grandson that little bit of money, and he goes and he plays the claw machine, and he notices that his grandson doesn't come back very quickly, and he thought, well, maybe he's having a good time, maybe this is going well, he didn't think anything of it, they kept eating, finishing up their dinner, and where's my grandson? Well, the grandson got frustrated because he put the money in the claw machine. The claw went down, and what did it do? Didn't pick up anything. Grandson got the idea, I'm going to get my prize. And he climbed in to the entrance of that claw machine. And you may remember this because it made the news here in Houston. He got stuck that claw machine. There are pictures of him sitting in that claw machine. Some of you may remember, it was about 2007. And I'll never forget that young man. Now, I know he's grown up, he's married, has his own children, but quite remarkable, that story to me about how frustration led him. Hey, this is not working. All right, it's green, it's just not working. All right, so... Frustration led him to do something that um, I don't believe under normal, common manner he would have done so. But he did so because he was frustrated because he was not able to achieve his goal. He got so frustrated that he ended up doing something that he shouldn't have done. And of course, in that situation, he got stuck. Our sermon today deals with a subject that I think many of us in this room can relate to. And that is the subject of frustration. One dictionary defines frustration as the feeling of being upset or annoyed, especially because of inability to change or achieve something. And they put this particular word, frustration, in a sentence. I sometimes feel like screaming with frustration. Another source compared frustration with anger. Anger is like setting off an explosion of emotion. But frustration is more like a slow burn. And of course, I think we all can relate to the fact if your frustration lasts long enough, there's likely an explosion of anger not too far behind. And what we're going to see from our text this morning, Moses had been leading these Israelites through the wilderness for around 40 years. And it seems like every time he turned around, They were quarreling, they were grumbling, and they were complaining. You remember back when they reached the Red Sea, when Egypt's chariots were close behind them, the people said to Moses, Exodus 14, by the way, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out into this desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been far better for us to serve than the Egyptians than to die in this desert. Exodus chapter 16. Later they complain about the food 
that they ate. It tells us the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Exodus chapter 17. Then they complain about the water. The people quarreled to Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with this thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And then when they're about to enter the very promised land, they do it again. Numbers chapter 14, verse 2, All the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, would that we would have died in the land of Egypt, or would it that we have died in this wilderness? These people over and over and over again grumbled, complained, murmured, and I believe that God's Word warns us about this very practice. Quite simply, it tells us, do not do that. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, we must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. But every time Moses would turn around, it seemed like these people were constantly nipping at his heels. And it got so bad that at one point, Moses begins to even complain to God. Numbers chapter 11, look at verse 11 and 12. Moses says to God, why have you brought such trouble on me, your servant? Why are you angry with me? And why do you burden me with all these people? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give birth so that you should tell me, carry them at your breast as a nursing woman carries a baby to the land that you swore to give to their fathers? In other words, church, Moses, this whole situation, it was extremely frustrating. And Moses' frustration finally got to the point where, like I've heard people say, I have had enough of this. He was so frustrated, so irritated with them that he did what he should not have done. Now, church, let's stop right here. Let's be honest with yourself. Have you ever acted in a wrong way because of the frustration that you felt about a situation, about a circumstance, about the behavior of another person? Have you ever been so overwhelmed by frustration that you did or said something that you should not have done or said? Has that ever happened to you? But I want to really ask the question here, what did Moses do that was wrong? God tells Moses, take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water, so you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. So he so far, is he doing what he's been asked to do so far? Yes, 
He's taken the staff that God has commanded him. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Shall we bring, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Don't forget that word we. And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. Now I've asked you to be honest. Now let me be honest with you. There are several views traditionally that are put forth about this passage of what Moses did wrong. You may have heard sermons in your past preached about this particular passage. And you may have heard various preachers or scholars give you an answer as to what Moses did wrong. Some people believe God is angry with Moses because Moses did not follow his instructions. You ever heard that? Moses was supposed to speak to the rock, but instead he struck the rock, not once, but twice. And apparently, he struck it in anger, calling the people what, church? Rebels. Maybe, just maybe, there's something to that. But I think, honestly, there's more going on here. Folks, God told Moses that he did not uphold God as holy. Do you see that? What's that mean? Well, notice what, what, what Moses said. Again, he said, Hear now, you rebels. Shall we, circle that we in your Bible, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? See, in that moment, Moses did not proclaim the most important thing that was in play here in this moment. God was in charge, but Moses did not proclaim God's power, did he? He proclaimed his own. You folks want to grumble and complain at me? Well, just let me show you what I can do. And in his frustration with these Israelites, Maybe for just a moment, he forgot about God and he focused on himself. You know, the more I've studied this incident over the last 20 years of my life, the more it's made clear to me that Moses' sin was not that he became frustrated. Let me tell you, church, if it was inherently sinful, to become frustrated, then we'd all be in trouble. No, his sin was not that he became frustrated. His sin was, and listen, here it is, he allowed his frustration to take control of him. And then he sinned due to that respect and reaction to frustration. He behaved in a way that was sinful because he let his frustration get the better of him. There's all kinds of frustrations. For example, they're small things. Like getting stuck in traffic. Isn't that a little frustrating? Or you go outside to mow your lawn. And you pull or you turn. If you're, if you're me, you pull, right? Because I, I couldn't afford those ones with a switch on it. You pull and you pull and you pull and your lawnmower, it just won't crank. That's frustrating. That's a, that's a small frustration. Or what about this? Your parents, you ever get frustrated having to pick up somebody else's dirty laundry? Small things can frustrate us. But again, it's not the frustration. It's how we respond to the frustration, right? 
That's what makes a difference. The way we respond to our frustration if it causes us to lose our temper in the process, or curse under our breath or out loud, and it's headed in a direction you do not need it to go. Again, church, hear me out here. It's not the frustration, because I know that there are times where we become frustrated and we begin to think less of ourselves spiritually. But again, it's not the frustration. It's how we respond. And even small frustrations can lead us to sin. What about big, though? Let's talk about some big frustrations. Now, I'm not talking about traffic jams or broken lawnmowers or somebody's dirty pair of underwear on the floor. I'm not talking about that anymore. I'm talking about those big frustrations. What about that annoyance that just does not go away? What if there are frustrations that keep staring you in the face day after day? Week after week, month after month, year after year, this frustration just will not go away. I'm not talking about the frustration that you're married to, so don't go that direction this morning. I'm talking about the frustrations that really bug us. And the reason why they bug us is because we realize we can't fix them. We can't change them. We can't control them. And we cannot get away from it. Keep in mind, this is kind of like the Israelites who were always quarreling with Moses. Just like those Israelites, these big frustrations continually show their presence in our life. Well, here it is, church. If You've been looking for an answer to your frustration, whether big or small. Let me tell you, first and foremost, even in the midst of long-term frustration, everybody in this room, listen to me, you've got to remember in the course of that frustration, you must remember, it is absolutely not an option to fail in remembering this. You must remember in every sense of the matter, when you are dealing with frustration, remember to always uphold God as holy. When frustration brings you to a boiling point where you are tempted to set aside the holy life that God has called you to, when you are tempted to respond in a worldly manner, when you are facing that temptation, when you are facing that frustration, do not forget that God is big enough and He cares enough to take care of whatever problem you are facing. The point is, the way that we can stop our frustrations from leading us to sinful reaction is to remember to look to God for the guidance, and His help, and the source of power that He can deliver. Paul said it in Philippians chapter 4, 11 through 13. We read this as we opened up together those famous words that all of us have read at one point or another, especially the last word, I can do all things through Him who gives me strength, even overcoming our frustrations. If you will hold on to God as the source of holiness in your life, I promise you this, God will carry you through it. Let's go back to Numbers chapter Think of how different this entire situation would have played out. If after receiving the charge, Moses takes the staff, goes out to the children of Israel, and follows God's command and upholds God as holy, how different might this play out? 
Moses would have entered the promised land in this life. Do not allow a frustration in your life to fester to the point where it keeps you from God's promise in your life. And that is, that is, folks, I'm telling you this morning, sometimes we look at frustration as just being a, man, it's not really a very important subject, but it really is. Last week, we said beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? Well, let me tell you, frustration is in the eye of the beholder as well. Because some of us, our frustrations in life causing us to do and say and live in such a way that is not pleasing to God. And that will keep us from the promise of eternal life. So don't allow that. Trust in God. Trust in His promises. Know that He's got the power to quench the thirst of all your frustrations. This morning we're going to sing this song of encouragement together. Roy's let us in song today, songs of praise, songs of remembrance of Jesus Christ, Son of God, and His sacrifice. But now, we want to take this opportunity. This is a song of encouragement. It is also a song of response, whether it is a song where you decide during the course of this, or maybe you've already decided that I need the prayers of my church family. We want to be here for you. Maybe it's private. Maybe you've got a frustration in your life and you're sitting there this morning and you realize it's time to really hand over the keys of that frustration to God. You can do that. That is your response. Maybe today you're not a Christian. You've not been clothed with Jesus Christ. You have no access to that power that I've spoken of this morning. Avail yourselves of that forgiveness, that power, be buried with Christ in baptism. This morning, if we can assist anyone within our church family, any of our guests, please come as we stand and sing.